What's up guys, it's Gary with Fresh From The Farm Fungi. Today's conversation is with my friend Thomas in New Zealand from Oak and Spore Mushrooms. So we both started our mushroom farms in 2018 and we've learned along the way. And this is kind of just a conversation we had about leveling up to the next level and um, you know, just the everyday ins and outs of having your own mushroom farm um, so I hope you guys enjoy this conversation as much as I did, and I'm looking forward to having more talks like this in the future. All right, enjoy. All right, so we are live with um, Thomas from Oak and Spore. So the last time I, I uh, spoke with you, I think your arm was hurt. What is a, uh, how's that healing up? Yeah, it's, it's good, man. You can actually see a scar there. Oh man! Yeah, so they had to um, reconnect the bicep, cut it open, and reconnect it into the to the bone. Um, so that was a bit of a oh, it was a bit of frustration for a few months. Then I actually had my dad helping me part time um, wow. for all of the bagging and all the harvesting and, and selling at the market. I couldn't really use it much. So, but it's good now. Apparently, the full ruptures heal faster than a partial rupture. Wow! So it only took it only took three months, and it was pretty much back to normal. All right. Well, I'm glad to hear that. So yeah, 100%. And then yeah. I think the last time I, I was talking with you, um, you guys were just about to close on a property. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you, like, how is that going? It's probably super exciting. It's good, man. We're actually, I'm in it right now. So this is the new, this is the new facility behind me or part of it. Wow. Um, so it's good now. We need to. I need to be building it, but we're actually in a level four lockdown here in New Zealand because we've got the obviously the Delta is moving around, so we can't really. We are an essential business, being mushroom farming, being a food producer, yeah. but I can't go to the shops and get like things I need to build right, which is like nails, you know, bits of wood, I like a lot of little things to really carry on. So I'm just trying to do bits and pieces, but this is part of the facility here, and it goes through. And you can see that door down there. Yeah. That goes through to the um, the other half of this building, which will be where all the fruiting takes place. Sorry about that camera. Um, so we're pretty happy. We're in it now. And we've got a big area outside for all the bagging and whatnot. So pretty, um, yeah, it's all pretty moving pretty quickly. A bit slow right now because of lockdown, but before then it was moving pretty quickly. So Wow. Yeah. So uh, where is that in location to where you were previously? Close, you... like... 12 minutes drive oh yeah so that's good for your customers then you get to you know kind same. Of same, same region yeah yeah it's the same i mean there's not many i suppose it's different from the united states where you see people will geographically move like quite a distance because it's the same country but in new zealand people don't often uh, do that too much you tend to hang out around the city because there's only like five major cities ours is the second largest city in new zealand and it's only got three hundred and fifty thousand people Wow. So it's, the cities here aren't, aren't too big, so you kind of got to stick pretty close to them. Cool. Yeah, yeah. so we, we are actually um, under contract ourselves for a property in Sedalia. So it's about 30 minutes south of Denver. Um, yeah. And we're supposed to be closing in 12 days. So I'm pretty excited. Oh, that's exciting. And yeah, I feel like you guys are an inspiration to our farm. And like, it's very cool to see you know, you take that leap and now I'm, I'm going to do that. And, um, I don't know if you have any advice for, you know, making that transition or. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a hard, you just got to go for it. Right. And obviously have you got a property that's got going to have a farm onto it? It's not just like your own home. Um, the property we bought, it's, it's five acres. So it's pretty wooded and there's a cabin there already. So it's this beautiful, like a frame cabin. There's oh, pictures wow. of like the guys who built it in the seventies. They like yeah. cut all the lumber down by hand and like sawed everything. And it's, oh, it's really, like, it's like a masterpiece cabin. And then um, a little bit to the North, there's a nice flat area. So I'm actually going to be building my own Quonset building. That's go going to be separate. And then my plans for transitioning is I'm going to do all my block production here still. And then yeah. I'm going to um, fruit out my bags at the new facility until we can establish a lab there. So it's going to be a, a lot of work at first, but 
I mean, we yeah. just love the love the views and location, and it's yeah, uh, yeah, just more oh, space. Brilliant. That's that's great news, and it's good. Five acres is a good chunk. Not to say that's two and a half hectares. Yeah, I don't know the conversion, but it's a lot. It's a lot more. Yeah, I think it's yeah. yeah. So we're on we're on four hectares here, so it's about ten acres. Um, so we we got we got a lot to plant out, and our goal is to plant um, uh, obviously trees that have mycorrhizal fungi on them. Yeah. Um, so tr- I don't know if we'll go too much. We're going to do a lot of truffles, but I'm not too sure now, just because I think having the dog and all of that might add a, another whole layer of complexity. Mm-hmm. But we were actually emailing yesterday. We're getting trees with saffron milk caps on them, wow. which is uh, Lactarius deliciosus, I believe. Yeah. Um, so we're going to get those in the ground. Our goal is to get the bleats in the ground. Um, cool. And once we get some of those in, look to see what else we can get that's a mycorrhizal species. So we want trees, yeah. like thousands of trees over the property. Cool. Yeah. So hold on. I've got a. Um, so I actually got some fresh um, chanterelles here. Oh, look at that. And I wanted to uh, make, show you like a, a quick hack that I've been working on. So, um, first of all, if you want, I'm, I can make a, a spore print for this um, in real time here. So kind of my method for that is I've just been using some, um, if I don't finish pouring a full plate, I'll uh, save some of the Petri dishes. Or if I have like an old culture, I'll clean these out and yeah. then I'll just stick the mushroom cap right there. So then you can yeah. get a nice spore print. And then when you want to do your uh, spore inoculations, you could just fill that well with some sterilized water and then make the transfer um, onto, I, onto some auger. Um, I watched your series, your breeding series. Yeah. Your three parts. That was, that was, that was cracker, right? That was, that's one of the best cool. pieces of information regarding uh, breeding mushrooms. I think you can get on the internet, right? Yeah. Well, I appreciate it. And um, for everyone who's watching this, if you haven't checked out, um, oak and spore. I mean, you've got so many videos too that um, are really inspiring to me. And I feel like just, you know, the community as a whole is growing pretty rapidly. And I like to get the perspective from a lot of different people. Um, yeah, it's, it's good to talk to other people, especially other content creators out there, right? Because everyone yeah. does, in the mushroom growing world, everyone does stuff differently. And there's no, there's no set rule for anything. There's no like, uh, there's no better way. Like, yep. There are some good ways of doing things, but there's no better ways. And, and that's what's good about a lot of the mushroom grow communities are really accepting of how other people do things, especially because it's into, like nation independent, country independent, and like things are always slightly different. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So another, um, I guess, a quick hack is like the, the tissue biopsy. So I have a syringe here. Yeah. And this is a sterile liquid culture. And then I have a slant. So yeah. I like doing the slants like this because the opening is so small that you can just quickly um, throw some tissue in there. But basically what I do is I'll take a little bit of this liquid culture just so there's some back pressure. And then with one of these uh, fresh golden chanterelles here, you can just crack it in half and then reach that sterile center. So see that white area? Yeah, and yeah. I'll take my syringe here um, and try to gather some of that tissue. And then you can see there's a little piece yeah, there. Is, yeah. And then and then I've got a little bit of tissue in the slant here. And then as that yeah. grows out, it'll kind of outcompete any bacteria that might be in there, or you can do the same thing and go directly into a liquid culture. So um, I remember you were searching for some chanterelle cultures at some point. Um, yep. So if you want, once these grow out, I'll uh, send you some. some <coughs> so to you. We had, I'm renewing my permit. It's taken them a long time. And they um they they came back to me and they've actually removed totally removed chanterelles from import availability 
Oh which man, that really, is crazy. Which is really upsetting. <clears throat> there were three. They, there were three. They took off the chanterelle, the um, paddy straw mushroom, yeah, vol, volvaria or volvacia, or I forget the name for it. Um, yep. And then, a, and then a, a third one, which is a, I think it's a popular Japanese mycorrhizal mushroom. So they Mat- took it off. Matsutake, maybe. Matsutake, yeah, that's my favorite. Yeah, I think it's. Yeah, that one there. And so, because I had all three of them on my permit to import, and they specifically emailed me and said, we have to take those off. They're, they're no longer, they're removing them for import availability. So at this point, there'll be no chanterelles in New all Zealand. Right. And I, don't, I don't think there are any here. And that's unfortunate. I was hoping to get some, um, but it is what it is. What about, really uh, do you ever, can you cultivate bluefoot or... Um... No, Clitocybe nuda, nuda, I believe it's like a little no. purple mushroom. No, the list, unless it's unless it's here already. If it's All here, right. we can. If and if it was here before, it had to be in here. I think before like eighty one or something. Eighty one's where a new law came in, new legislation, and it defines new organisms. And everything from that organ that legislation is considered a new organism if it wasn't there beforehand. Mm, interesting. So, all, so most mushroom species we are unable to grow. And it's a real, it's one of the, the hardest mm. points about growing mushrooms in New Zealand is they're really, we've got a really minimal selection of cultivatable mushrooms. Yeah. I guess that yeah. makes more value for breeding your own strains though. So um, I'm working on a new technique for that as well. I'm calling it um, hyper breeding. So basically the idea is that I would eliminate all of the, um, the agar culture steps and go directly into a liquid culture like this. So I'm taking a sterile, um, mushroom or, you know, as close to sterile as possible. And then you put it on a Petri dish like this above a liquid culture in front of the flow hood. And then as the spores drop into the solution after about four or five days, the, the compatible pairs will mate in solution and you get, you know, the, the strongest survive. So, um, I'm, I've done that for cordyceps and I'm going to be putting out a video that's a little bit more descriptive, but I feel like if you don't have as many options, maybe you can just breed your own and you know, that that's, could what, that's what I've been doing. Part. Yeah. So 80% of my production is Italian oyster. I saw you had some, you posted a picture of an Italian oyster on uh, yeah. yep. Instagram a few days ago. Now Italian oyster, it's strange because it's really prone to abnormalities yep yeah and it's and we've got a strain which doesn't is it doesn't do that at all a lot of strains will do that but uh, we've got a strain which doesn't do that and it produces a really uniform good high quality mushroom the only problem is that it actually you've got to be very 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 particular with its environment we've got other strains which aren't as they don't care so much about the environment but this yeah. one if it's too hot too dry too cold it loses its color fast or it, it cur- curls faster it serrates along the edge fast um, but we we've been having some luck now with breeding. Um, we're trying to cross because I want a culture like that, which is better, more resistant to overgrowing and has a deeper color. Yeah. And all I've been doing is getting a petri dish right in front of the flow hood and getting a mushroom and tapping yep. it in front of it, and then getting a, a second one which I want to cross it with and tapping it in front of it. And then we right, so just in, tapping the spores right on, just straight on. And then you look at that dish and you. You watch it, and after a few days, you'll see the colonies arise, and you yep. just pick the best, fastest growing ones that look of high quality, mm-hmm. um, and we just quickly isolate them off, and then isolate them again usually to try yep. and make sure we haven't isolated them with the other spores. Um, and the it's uh, it's the success rate is is quite poor. So far, of all the mushrooms I've done it with, we've only had one real good candidate as a keeper, and it produced really interesting mushrooms, like a really really dark color. And it was just all cap, not much stem, um, and it was a really and it, and it was really resistant to overgrowing. Um, so we're really happy with that one. But most of the other ones we're growing are just like oh, it's just a substandard mushroom, right? Like not good for commercial cultivation. Yeah, that's what I find as well. Probably maybe ten percent are you know um, yeah. cultivation worthy, and then ninety percent of them just they just either don't really produce a lot or they're super finicky. <laughs> We've had them not, and I and I picked this up from your video how you were talking about um, uh, 
mono, what is it when it's only one one set of chromosomes? Yep. You call it a, like um, a, ha- a haploid or haploid. A monoclonal. And, uh, you called it a haploid. And what was the other one? The, yep. the, a diploid the, is one they're already like, mated. Yep. Yeah. So, and it was, and I think the problem was I've, I've done some breeding early on and I was trying it and we were getting, mush- I was getting it to colonize bags, but it would never fruit mushrooms. Yep. And I'm thinking maybe it was because it was a haploid. And it's yeah. just like, a, it's just a single sex mycelial colony. And I've had it with shiitake and a shiitake wouldn't go brown or anything. It just sort of colonized, filled the bag with white stuff and stopped. Yeah. Um, and I've had it with a lot of oysters. And I, I always thought that because I'm, I've never studied mycology or anything. All this is self-taught or self-taught on the internet. And I thought once the mycelial colony was growing, it's because it's already joined. Um, yep. but yeah, I learned that it wasn't. So that was yeah, good, so you good probably, information. Right? Yeah. You probably had just an isolate and there is actually a couple of people who are interested in those types of cultures for, um, hydroponic cultivation. So especially here out in Denver, there's a bunch of, um, cannabis facilities and for those plants, they consume a lot of CO2. So they have to supplement um, carbon dioxide into the grow rooms and you can use that mycelium as a way to supplement more co2 so it's kind of like a symbiotic yes. relationship C- co2 grow bags yep yep yeah yeah i've seen them i've seen them before right there's a there's a big american company which does them and they export here but there's a few a few of the other growers obviously make them um make them around but yeah i, I always thought they found a strain that wasn't fruiting that was my what I thought, and obviously that's most likely they just found a, a haploid. Yeah, I, I yeah. did like a, a turkey tail, one of those for a while, and then eventually they just die off because they're not really producing mushrooms. So that's kind of the challenge is keeping those yeah. going. But um, so I have a question for now that you have more space, um, are you going to devote – individual grow rooms to individual um types of mushrooms or are you still going to like mix and match different varieties together like what is your take on you know um, we have we have two fruiting rooms here yep yep and each one's 18 square meters so i don't know what that is in feet it'd be i don't know 18 18 by they're about 2.6 by 7 i think 7.2 meters all right um and we're not actually <coughs> we're not actually um, having individual f- species per grow room. Mm-hmm. We're having it. We're going to have it at different because one of the challenges I find is to get a good pin set, you want to pump that humidity high. Yeah. But for quality of fruit body, you actually need to taper the humidity off. Mm-hmm. And when we we put in bags every right now it would be if we were in a lockdown every Wednesday our bags go in. Mm-hmm. They go in for Wednesday and we harvest. They're generally ready to harvest the next the following Thursday, Friday mm-hmm. um, for the Saturday market. Yep. Um, and we found that that we would do that, but then changing the, the the humidity parameters to get a second flush out was incompatible with having good quality mushrooms on that first flush. Yep. So what we want to do is one week the room bags will go in that room, and then the following they'll go in the next room. Mm-hmm. And then when when you put that other room and that should t- time it all correctly so you can change the humidity levels in each room to uh, elicit good flushes and then to taper off the humidity for good quality mushrooms. So that's the plan. Uh, mm-hmm. It might change, but that's the plan. And that's only because fruiting in one fruiting room, that humidity management is quite challenging. Yeah, I agree. And I think uh, just cleaning, like keeping up with cleaning, if you have yeah. different rooms, you can just pull them all out. Pull them out, add- right? Yeah, it's going to make yeah. it a lot easier. Yeah. Yeah, cleaning's always been a pain, and we would take, we would actually harvest, often just harvest, and then every bag comes out, and then get in there, quickly blast, quickly scrub the balls down. Yeah. Um, but we do different levels of cleaning, so we'll do a real deep clean and then taper it off to just like, because oh, I can open the whole end of my fitting room and basically hose the ground and sweep all the, the crap, because the floor gets a lot of crap on it as well. Yeah. And that's a real, I find that a real annoyance because you walk in with your, you should, we get a lot of condensate on the floor because the concrete's cold mm-hmm. and we heat. Um, and so the floor's always wet 
And every time you walk in with the shoes or your boots, you walk out, like dirt and stuff gets tracked in. The, um, the new, to combat that, the new facility here will actually, the goal is to have an um, exclusion zone where you actually have to take your shoes off and change into Crocs. And the Crocs are only the only shoes you wear into like your clean room and then another pair for your fruiting room just to try to keep everything quite clean. Yeah, I think that's a great plan. Um, they even make like little sticky mats you can get <coughs> for the entranceway. So yeah. if you're, you know, entering the building, you can stand on those and kind of clean off your shoes. But I feel like, um, yeah, it's going to be a big advantage to have two different rooms. And I'm sure as you expand into the outdoor stuff, um, that will be exciting as well. Something I did a little different this summer is I planted um, some King Strafaria, uh, yeah. the Strafaria Reguso annulata. And then yeah. those, every time we get a big storm, there'll be a nice flush. So it's kind of fun to have like that addition to our, you know, really highly controlled environment. And I think you know, long term with those truffles, that that's going to be fun to you know watch that develop. And do you have yeah. any procedures for that, or like, are you kind for, of messing around? We're just messing around the tr the truffle. It's obviously there's a ch an extra challenge to truffle. There's actually a truffle which grows really well here. Wow! And there's a trophy year they call the trophy year down the road, and that's actually quite big, and that produces the being keto truffle. The Bianchetto is quite a high value truffle, not like the black truffle in value, but it grows in a really set, likes a really sandy soil, sandy, well draining soil. And the soil here is really sandy and well draining. So we thought about getting some of those in, but first we want to have the, because we're a, we're a mushroom farm first and foremost, so I thought we'd probably stick with the traditional mushrooms. So we'll get the saffron milk caps in and then try and find uh, like bullet cultures to inoculate our own trees with. Um, and get those in first, and then <clears throat> they, um, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> it's all about choosing the right tree yep. for the right species as well. Some trees will produce, like when they did a, I was reading, there's a bit of research I've just done just down the road here for saffron milk caps, um, and they did it on pine and um, pinus radiata, and then a, a not a stone pine, a, uh, uh, Sylve Sylvester pine or something or rather. Sorry, I forget the name off the top of my head. But one tree produced about two or three early years earlier, the Pinus radiata started producing it like year three or four, but its yields only ever got up to about two or 300 um, kgs per hectare. But this, the other pine that they would, were doing it on produced it. It didn't start producing until like year six, but they actually got the... Um, the, the yields up to a ton per hectare. Wow. So if you've got a hectare, and I think it's about 400 trees per hectare, so they're producing a ton of saffron milk caps per hectare, obviously at a smaller scale, but when you scale that up to a hectare, that's what it would have produced. So it's all about choosing the right type of spe uh, tree species as well. We're thinking about getting some trees which hopefully maybe produce a bit earlier because mm -hmm. part of the trees then waiting a full six years is a bit of a, a bit of a ball break. You're just waiting, waiting, waiting. Yeah. Like, come on, mushrooms, come on, mushrooms. <laughs> but if you can have a small patch of trees which just started a bit earlier, you can then maybe start, you know, if you get them a bit two, two years earlier, even if you only get like 50 kilo in a season, you can start sort of trying to get that, find that market for them and find chefs who are interested in them instead of all of a sudden at year six getting like 300, 400 <laughs> kilos in a season. Yeah, that's a really cool idea. So do you do any kind of irrigation or are you just leaving it up to nature? Uh, we will irrigate slightly. Um, irrigating here is challenging. We've actually got a, a really good bore, which is a well. We call them a bore in New Zealand. Um, and that's 50, it's just behind here, and it's 54 metres down at drills. Um, but to actually use that for irrigation, you need all consents from the council. Um, and then we've got a waterway running out the back of the house and to suck from that, you need consents as well. So there will be challenges. We might have to look at consents are very, are very hard to get, like very hard to get wow. um, uh, to, it's to the point where we probably wouldn't get one inside of 20 years here to suck water up from the ground. Wow. So there'll be other, we're going to have to look at other things, perhaps storing but, water off season to use. Yeah. I wonder uh, if there is a, like a benefit for the mushrooms to be there that you can, you know, argue for, like if it filters the water or if it helps 
like store the water as a reservoir. I think that the big thing is that we're heavily, there's a lot of problem where we are right now is that they've dumped so much nitrogen on the soils because it's a lot of dairy farming and whatnot and a lot of farming, a big farming nation that the nitrates actually have seeped into the water table and some bores now, wells, uh, yep. actually got really high nitrates when you pump the water out of them. Wow. And so there's all this talk in New Zealand water, water quality here is a big issue, political, big political issue as well. Um, so I think I think it is attractive the fact that we're not we're not we're not water using water ir- to irrigate fast growing crop that we have to fertilize keep fertilizing. We're using it to grow trees that'll be there for like a long time. We won't really need to fertilize them, um, and of course they do lock up carbon from the atmosphere as well. So I think there's a benefit. Now it's, I, I I don't know if having those benefits would actually affect your ability to get water or not. I, I yeah. don't think they. I don't think they think quite think about it like that. That it may not particularly care. Um, but who knows? That's just these are just things we have to go down in the future. I think the trees will grow pretty well without irrigation. Um, but if you really want with irrigation, the one thing you can do is try to um, stimulate mushroom growth. Yeah. By like applying water, you know, five days in a row if it's cloudy to try and get, get a flush come up. So that'll be the predominant reason, I would think, to irrigate. Absolutely. Do you guys get morels, morcella? Yes, we do. They're very hard to find. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, there's a company called Blue's Best, and they um, are going to be sending me some grow kits. And then this year I'm going to try to build a hoop house. And yep. then... Um, I'm just going to keep on expanding on my morale cultivation, but I feel like that might be another passive mushroom that you can try to plant. So we, I'll, I've got a, I've got a few morale cultures. We bought one, we bought it from fun, fungi.com. All right. Perfect die. Yep. No good. No good. It won't produce sclerotia. Right. No good. Really? And, and so that was bad, but then I've had dried morales and I've, Again, just peachy just tap, tap, tap. Yeah. Close and and we had morale cultures like like that, right? And they just they just grow so fast. Yeah. And then it would grow and then um it would produce sclerotia really quickly, like these big hard balls all over the dish. And we yep. sent we sent it for uh, uh, to get genetic tested and it came back as morel, morel species. Yep. So it's easy to um morale's easy to once you get one, it's easy to propagate, I think. Yep. Uh, it's the fact of being able to, there's confusion around if it's mycorrhizal or if it's a sap rope, right? Yep. And some are both, some are one and some are the other, I think. I'm I not agree. Sure. I feel like and, they're very translucent or something. They're very, um, you know, they can go between it, I think. Yeah. I think. Or, or some are slightly prone to, some are prone to one and some are, um, yeah. are only mycorrhizal and it's about yep. I, I read a good place to find information about growing them is the google patents all right yeah have you ever looked at google patents no i have not just just search morales on google patents and you'll actually find a lot of information about how people have patents on how to grow them all right a, a lot of it's about like have you seen in china you'll see them growing morales in china and they've got these bags placed everywhere Yep. Yep. So that is the method that I'm going to try to replicate. Um, the people that send those kits, they send out, it's basically like a a mushroom block. And then on one side, they have a template and then it's a bunch of little dots. So you flip it on its side and then you poke a bunch of holes in the one side. And the idea is as it's laying on the soil, the mycelium will spread outwards. And then once it hits a certain point, then it'll form the sclerotia. And then you have to maintain a 50% uh, moisture content in the soil and it can't freeze. And the pins are very sensitive. So you have to be careful with like temperature swings and stuff. But um, apparently this guy, you know, he's been growing them in these huge, patches with a uh, he'll put like poles and then hang shade cloths over him and there's some videos online and he's in um indiana or iowa i think but i'm very excited to try this uh method That's, with like a hoop house over it and i've seen that as well and i've also i've also heard another way where they inoculate the soil and they put bags of food on it 
Mm. And the, mor- the culture goes up and starts eating the food and it transports the nutrients out to sclerotia and then you actually take the food away. You, when you remove the bag, the, the morale of the, of, the, of the medium it's in is really nutrient void. It'll realise its food source is gone and it will force it into, that's one, another one I read on a patent, force it into flushing. And then you see them, they grow them on mounds like that there and they've got ditches between them and they actually flood, flood the ditches. Wow. And that would be that would be where you have to keep that. You're saying you have to keep the moisture content quite high. And they flood them, and apparently the the shift in pressure from the water table moving up forces them to fruit. And and that's another way. Of, like there's a few different ways to that I've seen people attempting to grow them. Mm-hmm. I've never seen people very successful, other than obviously the farms in China, which look to yeah. have done it very well. But I think a lot of them is. Uh, a lot of it will be the culture. They've got a good culture for it. Yep, that's what I was going to say. A lot of people try to do it with the wrong cultures, right? Yeah. And that's where you need to find that culture that wants to grow. It's like a sap probe, not as a mycorrhizal mushroom. Cool. Well, the race is on then. <laughs> the race is on, yeah. We would like to get some in, but again, they're very, I mean, if you find a, if you find a method to do it reliably, oh, we would love to, but I think it's just so hard, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So what is, uh, what is your plans moving forward now? Or as I guess, as soon as the lockdowns, <clears throat> we, fo- we find out today, if we come out of level four to level three. Yep. And once we're on level three lockdown, I can actually go and get the stuff I need to keep building. We had, we were supposed to have the floor in here, but everything in here is actually coming out. You can see it all. Everything has to be taken out. We're having a professional cleaner come in, clean all the floors here. Mm-hmm. And then um, we're getting a new epoxy layer. So we're going to get some more epoxy, epoxy the floor again, um, paint the walls in here. We can't get paint. So we needed to paint the walls, can't do it. And then in the fruiting room, we've got all our Bondor, which Bondor is a company in New Zealand, which make like a sandwich panel and it's like a foam sandwich between metal. Um, and that's going to be all the walls. And you can see these white lines on the floor here. That's where the, um, this is going to be the lab right here. And then the one just down here is going to be uh, incubation. Um, so the bond door panel goes up and that's basically uh, the two fruiting rooms are made out of it and they're building it all purpose built for me. And yeah. we'll just bring, it'll be like a kit set, we bring it in and um, erect it. And then just walls go from the ceiling to the floor in here. Um, the doors on the end here. So it's all, it's all, there's a lot to do. It's just waiting for that level four to finish so we can continue doing it. Yep. Are yeah. you, um, are you doing all this solo? I know you said you had some, help from um your father-in-law or whoever. yeah my dad my dad's my dad's been helping me um your dad is your, he yeah. doesn't he still works of course i do most of it solo um, i learned fairly quickly from the last farm i would do everything on my own and i learned that like if you can't do a professional job don't do it like yeah. pay the pay the professionals yeah um and so that's what I, i'd always the last time i always tend to try and save money by doing it myself I know I'm very capable, I can do a lot myself, but sometimes the quality was just quite low. Um, but it would be a bit ad hoc, you know, a bit jury rigged. Yeah. Um, yes. So I think that this time I'm like, no, nah, if it needs to be done, it needs to be done properly. Like I've got the concrete pad out the back, which we're laying in our pole barn where our mixing area is going to go. Yeah. That I did the boxing and I put all the mesh down, but I'm paying concreters to come in and actually pour the concrete and smooth it for me. Just because, yeah. again, it's like I can I can pay a concrete truck to come and dump the concrete, but I've never smoothed concrete in my life, and so that I could just and it would save me it save me probably two two thousand dollars to do that. But again, it's like no, at this time yeah. I need to yeah, get think, it done, get it long done long term, yeah, long yeah. term. Right, need a professional job, and and that's why I didn't build any of the walls. I'm getting a company just to manufacture all the walls. But everything's done like this time. It's going to be done to a really high standard because the last part. I mean. The standard was quite low, but it was in my garage and I didn't have a clue what I was doing, right? Like I literally had no idea what I was doing. And you just got to, like, where do you start when you're building a mushroom farm? Right? you got to start somewhere, eh? Yep. Um, I think that's a good way to start is just use yeah. what you have available and then just kind of build on those successes. But yep. really yeah. And you learn, right? Yeah. It takes, you a lo- it takes you a long time to learn how to do everything and how everything works. And mushroom growing, I think one, two things. One, it's probably made to look quite easy on the internet where it's actually reasonably challenging um mm. uh, it's not challenging to grow some mushrooms if i can grow them but it's challenging to be consistent and high quality with your fruit bodies 
um, especially if you're in a, a, a country where the um, seasons change readily. Mm-hmm. And I do, and I do think the second point. I think YouTube often glamorizes it a bit, and they yeah, don't they, they don't show they don't show the labor you're out there doing, the bagging, all the cleaning, all the <laughs> you know opening old bags to get them down yeah. to the green waste. And, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff which isn't seen and people just see you harvesting some fruit and it's selling them, you know, yeah, fruit, mushroom farming. Um, yeah. But it's just all part of it, right? And the best thing to do to, for people who want to learn, I think, is just start in your garage, right? Yep, I, absolutely. Yeah. Just start small and then start small. see uh, how how that yeah. works before you make the big jump. But yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see, you know, the future for you guys. And I would yeah. love to come visit someday if I could, like someday uh, get out there. Yeah. I'll be back. I'll be back in America at some point. Um, my mom's actually from New York. Wow. All right. Yeah. What part so of New she, York? She's from, uh, Rochester. All right. I grew up in Buffalo, so that's oh. like an hour it's an hour west of. Oh, Rochester. that's on the that's on the border with Niagara. Yep, yep. It's yeah. right, right by Canada. Yep. Yeah, we I went near, went near a few years ago. Cool. Yeah. That's where um, I grew up. But if you're oh, ever wow. in Denver, you're welcome to come stop over and um, I'd yeah. love to get your your insight on some things. I'd I'd love to see your new farm as well. You have to send me some photos. Yeah, we're gonna do a video as soon as we close and. We had yeah. another property. So earlier in the summer, we were um, under contract for a different property. It was 10 acres, a little bit north. And then um, the more and more we were going through the whole process to close here, we found out that there's like lawsuits against the title and it just oh, kept getting yeah. pushed back. And we just were yeah. like, all right, we're done with this. And then about a week later, this property popped up. So it was kind of a blessing, but you know, the past three or four months have just been like a roller coaster ride trying to find the right spot. And um, honestly, you, you know yeah. the right place when you find it. We we went to an auction for another house right before this, which had a workshop on it. And we were prepared to we were prepared to like go go for that house. Yep. And I'm so glad we didn't. We <laughs> a week bef- a week before the auction, this one came up. And we went to the other auction and we and we watched it, we watched it, and we watched it. And where it ended, we were like, oh, we could have overbid the person, so we could have got it. But we're like, no, nah, no, nah, we're going to go for this house. We ended up putting an early offer in for this house, and they accepted it, and so they brought the auction forward, and we won it at an auction. So we're pretty pretty happy. But it's a lot to do. So Yeah. <laughs> but it's um, it's always exciting when you've got that new property yeah, to get into and, and sink your teeth into. Yeah, cool. Well, yeah. Um... I don't know if there's uh, anything else you want to, you know, mention, or I know, you know, we have probably a lot of the same viewers, but if anyone hasn't checked out Oak and Spore, um, I think, you know, one of my favorite videos of yours is the one where you make the little computer and you automate the grow room. So out here, I always use, um, uh, it's a humidistat. I can't remember the name, but I've gone through like six of them in the past year and uh, ink, ink birds, ink bird. Yeah. So I'm get, looking get, for an upgrade, but I don't get know. Rid, get, to, yeah. Get rid of, get rid of them. Get a Visala humidity probe. All right. And an Omron EC55 PID controller. All right. And yeah. Wire it up. And honestly, you'll, you'll be like, why didn't I do this? That's the one thing I'll tell people if they're going to start growing mushrooms is get a good humidity controller. Don't use ink bird. Don't use cheap. Can't use cheap. Yeah, I agree um, with that. So I'm going to have to make that change um, coming up. Yeah. Soon. There's actually an American company. There's one there I've got. That's a Dwyer. That's an American company, D-W-Y-E-R. Right. And that's just an old one. I think this is obviously quite old, but it's a humidus, humidity control, a humidus set. Um, mm-hmm. And you find them on eBay for quite right. cheap. And that's obviously American manufactured, so they're quite good. Um, and that it should still work fine. But you need good quality because anything, humidity above 90%, the cheap ones are horribly inaccurate. Horribly. Yep. Um, even good, even good quality ones are only like two percent, two within two percent accuracy above ninety. Um, so yeah, get a get a. That's one thing I recommend getting good quality, right? Yeah, absolutely. Quality yeah. over quantity. Yeah. Except in the beginning, because then 
you know, you're still learning. But and, and I mean, in the beginning, like the ink birds are fine, but they yeah. do break. They do break all the time. The human, the temperature ones aren't so bad, but the, the humidity are, are terrible. But yeah, I built that computer on my YouTube, and that's gone now. We've stepped with. We took that off because it actually failed to keep working, and it oh, took right. me a lot of it took me a lot of time to do. So we're, we're going back to an old PID controller, but the all new right. farm the new farm we've actually got a proper computer to do it all, so it's pretty good. Cool. Well, yeah, you have to do a video on that, and as soon as yep. you get your uh, fruiting rooms up, um, I'm going to be you know tuning in for that too. Yep. Lots to do, right? Lots to do. Yep. All right, well, I got to get going. I'm packing up some mushrooms for the weekend. So, uh, um, oh, yeah. you got I, a few to, you've got a few to sell? Yeah, we have. So, we're probably doing about 75 to 100 pounds a week. Sometimes it got into like 130, which that was a little too much for me. But, um, yeah, I feel like the 75 to a hundred is like my sweet spot right now. So yeah. I got about half of that done and we'll have a bunch more tomorrow and then we'll be at the Cherry Creek farmer's market. So we do that every Saturday. And then we also have a grow box program. Um, so there's a company called grow girl organics and yeah. they'll, they'll pick up about five or 10 pounds every Friday and then they distribute yeah. them in their food boxes. And then we also sell them at a grocery store. It's called the co-op at first. And I, I'll just go there every week and restock. Um, so it's kind of on my way to the delivery for that other place. And that's kind of, that's pretty much all I do is just directly to consumers. And um, I really appreciate, you know, the customers that come every week, but I'm very excited for this new place because I feel like people can come visit us more and, it's going to be more of like a farm setting. Um, so I, my, my long-term vision is to have like farm tours and like mushroom events there. And um, as that kind of develops, I'll, you know, start posting more videos on that. Yeah. Do, do you, have you had people at your farmer's market come mention that they, they recognize you from YouTube? Oh yeah. YouTube? All the time. And TikTok. <laughs> TikTok is the big one. I had this one video of just um me just harvesting all these different varieties and i still get people all the time like i saw you on tiktok and um, oh really I yeah. didn't use TikTok. i'm gonna have to go have a look yeah definitely yeah. check it out it's a it's a niche on tiktok the mushroom talk so yeah um you definitely get some exposure on there and i just yeah. love you know spreading the word and actually just learning from everyone so everyone has their own perspective and i feel like it's really cool to you know, get to communicate yeah. with you and you're way across the world, but I feel a connection still. And I'm yeah. just glad, glad, you know, I'm thankful for all the technology today. And um, oh, it makes it, it makes it so yeah. it's like it's content creators. I think are like that as such a value. And that's, I think why I started creating content. I was like, you know, I just want to sort of document what I do and put it out there to the world. And it sort of just developed from there. But honestly, like I still learn most of my stuff from the guys like you and you know Mossy Creek and Eric Myers, who still post content on YouTube. Yeah, which is such, such a great resource for people who want to learn, right? Absolutely. Mm. All right. Well, I'm gonna get packing some mushrooms. It was great talking with you, and um, you we'll too, dude. Do this again soon. Um, good we luck will. with the uh, with the the whole pandemic over there, and I hope you guys stay healthy and everything. Yeah, you, you too, know, man. Blows over. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, right? Hopefully, waiting for it to end. Yeah. Good, yeah. good luck with your move, man. You have to send me some photos once you right, once you get them on. All right. I appreciate it. Spot. Yeah, cool. Right. I'll talk to you next right. time. Talk to you later. Bye.